Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be covering how to give your remote a professional feel and look and some tools to help you do that. I'm not going to be doing as much on screen probably as you're used to seeing. If you're actually looking for some direct instructions involving the designer, probably just check out my other videos. Uh, but this is for those of you kind of looking to take your remote just to the next step. Uh, so the first thing I usually do when I start on a new remote is I create an about page down here at the bottom as a page group, my last page group. And I've got one copied over from another project just so you can sort of see what I'm talking about. It's just got some simple information. I might put my company information here as well as a shout out to Home Remote itself. Obviously it's their software. Uh, probably put the logo, mine and theirs. And this is a good starting point. But the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another page here uh, within this page group and this one I'm going to put as some maybe statuses so it's good within home remote like I had mentioned previously in one of the videos where we had gone and created this placeholder label here that was keeping track of which input the user had selected this is not as useful here on the main screen but it would be a great addition to a status screen here to keep track of that you might also be wanting to keep track of power on and off for different devices or uh, the current um, input that's selected or um, something like that. So there's a lot of different things you can put here. Basically you're just trying to leave yourself breadcrumbs to help yourself out later on down the road or the next person that happens to work on this system. If it's not you, help them out down the road. So when I actually start creating a remote from scratch, a lot of times I will look into the manufacturer and see what did they do because they've got great people on staff that make these remotes and a lot of remotes do the job just fine. So you can take uh, this Vizio remote, for example. I pretty much just copied this main area on the top, which all the main buttons were on. The up, down, left, right, enter, control, super common on just about every remote. And then below here, we've got some less used buttons. And then finally at the bottom, we've got the number buttons, which we utilized as well. If I take a look at my Onkyo remote, which is actually pretty dusty because it's been a while since it's been used, it sort of follows the same layout. Again, it's got the, uh, the center controls here, uh, which are typically operated by your thumb. Uh, we've got those on our project as well. Same with the numbers as the bottom. On this remote I'm using for my Kodi, it's a QWERTY keyboard. We're gonna get into this in a later video, uh, but again, just taking some inspiration from the remotes that we're basically uh, emulating. So going back to our screen here, one of the things that I like to start with is just a quick sketch out of what sort of buttons and layout do I want for this remote. Uh, I'm usually putting high priority buttons here at the top. I'm giving the thumb controls roughly in the middle to lower portion of the remote or of the uh, phone because that's where we're physically holding it. I like my volume controls here at the bottom, but I've also had great success with them lined up around the uh, right hand side. And then our lesser used buttons, I'm actually keeping off screen out of the way down below in this lower section. You can see with Kodi, I basically follow the same layout um, so that we've got pretty good consistency between the two, uh, which is great. So um, one of the last things I would do right before I started actually getting into the designer and making changes is I would create a general map to show, well, what is it that we've got to work with here and how is it interconnected together? This is a bit of a mess. I'm not an artist, but it gets the job done just fine. You can see I've got my receiver located here in the middle, basically acting as the heart and soul of the whole system. This is where all the inputs are coming in. I've got those labeled. I've got the HDMI and optical audio cables labeled, Ethernet wires, IP addresses, the global cache IRs are there with their port and module numbers. So a lot of great information here in just a quick sketch. It took me about 60 seconds to put this together and I referenced it multiple times uh, throughout the process here of building this remote. It sometimes can even just be a good idea if you're not leaving yourself uh, a well-documented uh, piece of uh, software to give to the owners or to keep to yourself. Just make a copy of this whole thing, save it as an image, and stuff it away deep in the, uh, in the selectable tabs here within your About page. You know, just the whole image. Don't bother, you know, making it pretty or anything. And you never know when that might come in handy. So that's good to have, and it'll give you a basic idea, a good starting point of, okay, how do I interconnect these two pieces? Okay, now how do I go from there with the next two pieces, etc. So another good uh, tip for making professional looking remotes besides basically just copying what the manufacturer has done 
is to worry about spacing. And I copied, I talked a little bit about this when we made this plus button down here. I wanted to make sure that the control itself, and you can see I've got it selected now, that the control itself is big enough for someone's finger to actually touch it. If I made it uh, sharp just around uh, just this small little plus, it's going to be very difficult for someone to actually hit that button because there's a lot of white space sitting around it, uh, which would not be controllable. So make sure that your controls are nice and big, uh, especially for touchscreen, which Home Remote specifically supports. Um, it's a good idea to, to double check and test everything as you're going just to make sure you don't have any crazy margins or anything, your buttons are all nice and big, they're cooperating the way you want, right? So if we get into a little bit of formatting, uh, we could do that now. I'm going to go ahead and format this one down here, the first of the number button. I know I've got several of these to make, 12 in fact, so it'd be a good idea to do all of the hard work now, go ahead and get one button exactly how I want, and then I can just copy and paste the rest. So I'm gonna go in here and check out the appearance, customize this guy here, and now we've got some options as far as font, uh, family, size, weight, etc. cetera. Um, what I'll probably do, let's see, I'm going to modify the background next, and I want the, uh, the theme in this case to be the accent color, which in case you didn't notice, is the same as the colors up here, right? Uh, so that looks good for a button. What I don't want is I don't want to be able to easily uh, press in the middle there and be like, uh-oh, I'm not 100% sure which button's gonna go, right? I've got a 50-50 chance. If we go back and reference the manufacturer button again, you can see that there's some space in between those, right? The buttons aren't uh, butted right up against each other, and we don't wanna do that either. And so to take care of that, we're gonna come down here and we're gonna modify these margins uh, I'm going to give it about five padding here. That looks good. So what we've done is we've actually shrunk the size of the control just a little bit, just to give some gaps around each control. So if you do, you're sort of hunting and pecking and you barely miss a button, you don't want to inadvertently hit another one. You'd rather hit just a little bit of white space. Uh, another thing you'll notice from most remotes is that there's no hard corners. There's no sharp edges on these. And we can take care of that as well on ours. Uh, we're going to go up here to border radius and I'm going to change this just to 5 and see what that does. You can see here in the radius of this border we don't have a little bit of curved corners on all the corners. So it looks actually uh, pretty similar to the one on the remote. I think that looks pretty good. So what other sort of things should you concern yourself with? Well, make sure that you don't put too many conflicting colors on one remote. Uh, one, two, maybe even three at the most is probably all you want on a single page or it might start looking a bit tacky. Uh, another thing to watch out for is to make sure that you're testing and transitioning this to your device for testing on a frequent basis. Things that might look and feel relatively okay here within the designer or even the runtime might behave weird on your device when it comes time to actually interact with them on a daily basis. For example, one thing that we found is that this slider down here, we might actually have this a little too small because it's so easy to move large amounts with this thing where typically in volume, you just wanna make small increments. That's why we went ahead and added these plus and minus buttons. This was a revision that I made to my own remote after the experience I had had with testing. Make sure that your macro skills are sharpened and on point because we're gonna to need to be able to automatically move around between pages, as well as local and external variables. So there's a lot of moving parts to these. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're basically keeping track of everything. We never want the user to get trapped somewhere either on a device with no way back to their starting point or even within the remote without a starting point. Later on, we can cover uh, hidden pages, for example, where we could send a user to that page using a macro. And then if we don't provide them a way back out they're trapped. Uh, the only way to get back to where they came from is to restart the application. We want to avoid things like that at all costs. So make sure you do extensive testing, especially involving macros and movement macros, as well as obviously saving often, even more often than you need to. Make sure you save a backup copy of your .hrp on a frequent basis as well, because sometimes when you're making changes within the designer, it automatically saves just to help you out but that makes it difficult to undo yourself back to where your error may have occurred. 
Also, when it comes to the design itself, try to keep it relatively simple. You don't want to cram every single button on a remote all into one screen. It's probably not going to fit, and even if it does, it's not going to be a good user experience. So take the time to learn your remote that you have right now and see which buttons and controls that you use really commonly, and those are the ones that you want prevalent front and center on your home remote. The rest of those rarely used buttons like aspect ratio, picture in picture, uh, audio, uh, controlling, stuff like that uh, is just not necessary. Another thing I always make sure I do, especially in home theater rooms, is I make doubly sure that only one device is controlling the sound output. In my case, I have a sound output option on my TV that's built in. It's got some small crappy speakers. And then I've also got the receiver itself. And I make sure that all sound is coming from the receiver. I turn the volume all the way down on the TV. I don't give any commands that interact with the volume on the TV. I don't want the user to accidentally do anything on the TV sound-wise. Uh, so I only want the sound coming from one location, which then makes it much easier to program and anticipate the commands that are going to be coming from home remote. Another good tip is for organization within the designer itself. So you can notice whenever I was creating devices, I was making sure to give them a name here in the source, but I'm also making sure to give them that same name within the variable because they do not inherit it when it comes time to select them from a dropdown somewhere, uh, like right here under state variables. You want to make sure that it's easy to find what you need. If you've got multiple devices in there and say volume up, it's going to be very difficult for you to figure out which one is which. So make sure that you carry over the parent name to the child variable. Similarly, make sure that you're taking good care to label and keep good order on all of your parent-child relationships here in your outline. And make sure that they're in the correct order, like this one is button, we're going left to right. As I went down, Netflix, Amazon, Cody is there, and then back is down. Make sure that you're keeping things in a good order so it's super easy to find. Make sure that you're also giving them all names. Name obviously is different than perhaps the text that's inside it or the states or anything else. It's just here for organizational purchase purposes. The last tip that I wanted to leave you with here is just to start small. You saw at the beginning of this series, I was only dealing with one device and one command, the TV and the Netflix button. And I made sure that I got that working flawlessly before I went on to adding the second device, in that case, the receiver. And from there, we added the Kodi and so forth. And even within each of those projects, I was only dealing with a single command at a time. For example, on Kodi, I was dealing with the left command and right command that was accessible in the main menu. There was no need to start immediately start trying to struggle with getting the video player to work uh, because all I wanted to do was make sure that my communication was solid before I went any further. And that sort of brings me to one last point I want to sneak in here, which is to make sure that your home network or the home network of your client is robust. This is absolutely key. Finicky Wi-Fi, uh, switches that aren't up to the task, um, weird settings, etc. Your home network has to be solid because all of the commands are traversing both the Wi-Fi and the wired network. So if you don't have a good grasp on that, uh, there's a lot of resources online that can help you out and a lot of manufacturers and products out there that are great. I won't go into the products that I use in my house because uh, I use a lot of commercial stuff uh, because that's what I deal with. Chances are it's not going to have any relevance to any of you. Um, but I just can't stress enough how much a good, solid, wired, and wireless network can be in a setting like this. And also, make sure that you're always going for a wired connection whenever possible. Obviously, the commands... You've only got really one option there, sending it from your phone or from your tablet or whatever touch device that you're using with home remote. But once it gets into your network, avoid Wi-Fi connection. So for example, here on my Onkyo and TV, I could have been using a wireless iTech uh, global cache IR repeater, but instead I chose the wired version because I know that the reliability of wired uh, controllers is much greater than wireless. It's much easier to set up static IPs and basically ensure a rock solid connection. It is absolutely key. So those are all the tips I've got for right now. A few on design and a few on infrastructure as well as some stuff to start out with if you're just getting new on a, on a or starting new on a new remote. Uh, so I hope this has all been helpful for you and that's all for this one. Thank you.